I don't mean to brag, but I was bilingual by the time I was eight. As an American growing up in the evangelical Christian church, I was fluent in English, obviously, and in Christianese. In fact, Christianese was so second nature to me that I assumed everyone spoke it. Despite what its name might imply, Christianese isn't actually a different language, but is a somewhat pejorative term for the numerous catchphrases and sayings prevalent in many denominations of Christianity. For example, a common Christianese saying that's familiar to Christians and non-Christians alike, especially in the southern U.S., is bless your heart. Bless her heart. <laughs> Whether someone's a Christian or not, they probably don't need to be told that bless your heart really means you're an idiot. Bless your heart is a unique example, though. Most Christianese isn't nearly as well known to outsiders and isn't nearly as facetious. A majority of these sayings in the minds of Christians are actually deep, even transcendently meaningful. Outside of a Christian context, though, this meaning is completely lost. Without knowing the Bible passages or theological issue a saying is referencing, it's impossible to know what's being said. In other words, Christianese is only well understood by Christians and is almost incomprehensible to those outside of the Christian faith. Or as Urban Dictionary so eloquently puts it, Christianese makes no sense to anyone unfamiliar with biblical texts, but earns you major points in the eyes of other Christians because it means your words are hella holy. God is the ultimate hype man. Recently, it seems many Christians are petitioning their fellow believers to refrain from using Christianese sayings. In fact, while doing some preliminary research for this video, the majority of articles I found on Christianese were written by Christians. Ironically though, some of these writers would use Christianese sayings to ask their readers to stop using Christianese sayings. For example, one writer stated that Christians shouldn't use Christianese because it's not biblical, which is a Christianese saying we'll be covering shortly. Christians seem to criticize Christianese for one or both of the following reasons. It alienates non-Christians, making it harder to share the Christian message with them, and many of these sayings are cliches rooted in harmful ideas. As a non-religious person who's against religious proselytization, I am not too concerned with Christianese making it harder to convert people to Christianity. However, I do agree that a lot of these sayings can cause harm. Today, we'll be discussing four Christianese sayings that I think can be harmful. I'll translate each saying into plain English, provide context for those unfamiliar with Christian culture, and explain how the saying can cause harm. In this series, we will take things that you may have heard that sound biblical, you thought were biblical, or you were taught they were biblical, but they, they're not biblical. It's the lie versus the truth. We're gonna start out with one that some might not identify as a Christianese phrase, but I'd argue actually is. That's not biblical can be taken literally, meaning it can refer to things that are literally not in the Bible, like, I don't know, motorized vehicles. Cars and motorcycles aren't mentioned in the Bible and could be deemed not biblical. This isn't how the phrase is normally used though. In my experience, Christians often use this phrase to dismiss a theological interpretation that they don't agree with. For example, there are many Christians who believe that the Bible condemns homosexuality. They point to various Bible verses to support this, like 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. God made them male and he made them female in his image. And the two shall become one. And he says, what God has brought together, let not man separate. On the other hand, there are many Christians who believe the Bible has nothing to say on the topic of homosexuality. They say that according to the original Greek, the homosexual offenders mentioned in 1 Corinthians refers strictly to pederasty and that it has nothing to do with the relations between two consenting adults. 
Both groups view the other as incorrect in their interpretation of the Bible and their resulting positions on homosexuality as not biblical. In my opinion, this Christianese saying can be harmful when Christians use it to distance themselves from the iniquitous actions of other Christians. Some of you might remember my Hillsong video from a few months ago. In that video, my husband Drew and I reviewed the documentary Hillsong, A Megachurch Exposed, and discussed how we believe that the corruption and abuse that ran rampant in Hillsong is a symptom of a larger problem that exists in evangelical churches as a whole. Well, <laughs> that video ended up being shared in Christian circles as evidenced by the flood of comments I received from Christians. I want to preface that I do very much welcome comments from Christians, as well as comments from people of any faith or background. However, I found many of the comments to be a bit alarming. Many Christians commented saying that it was unfair of us to draw comparisons between Hillsong and evangelicalism because in their opinion, the leaders of Hillsong aren't actually Christians and Hillsong's teachings aren't actually biblical. Therefore, evangelical Christianity can't be held accountable for Hillsong's actions. To me, this is alarming because if it's permissible to simply disavow those in your in-group whenever they're caught in a compromising position, when and how will the root of any problems that actually do exist in your in-group ever be addressed? If Christians can say that other Christians' actions aren't biblical and therefore escape accountability, who then is ever accountable? In this context, claiming that something is not biblical is just a way to shift the blame. It's a way to claim that non-Christians are the ones responsible for all abuse within Christian organizations because real Christians can't possibly be abusive. Your joy is directly related to what you put your focus on. So what are you focusing on? Are you focused on God or are you solely focused on your current situation in the natural? A lot of the time, joy is a choice. I must admit that choose joy isn't strictly a Christianese phrase. I mean, I'm almost positive Target sells some cheesy wall art with the words choose joy slapped onto it. That being said, the phrase is very popular in Christian circles, and many Christians point to Bible verses to support its use. It might seem like the meaning of the phrase is self-evident, but not all Christians agree on what joy is. Some say that joy is synonymous with happiness, some say that joy is a deeper version of happiness, while others say joy isn't a feeling at all. What most Christians seem to agree on, though, is that joy is something that God commands of his people and can be derived from maintaining a close relationship with him. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice. That's a command, not a suggestion. Psalm 37.4, delight yourself in the Lord. It's a command. I won't and frankly can't argue for what definition of joy the various authors of the Bible used, but I can comment on how I've heard choose joy used colloquially. In my experience, when someone tells you to choose joy, they're telling you that no matter what your current circumstances are, you can still experience happiness knowing God has a plan for your life. Even though life happens, the beauty of having joy in the Lord is that no matter what the ups and downs of life are, God's goodness, love, and faithfulness are always a constant that we can depend on. Now, I'm not against people relying on spiritual practice to get through tough times. However, the problem I have with Choose Joy is that it can invalidate genuine experiences or emotions. I mean, imagine opening up to your friend about a hardship you're facing and your friend responds by telling you to just choose joy. I'm sure you'd prefer that they listen and validate your feelings rather than tell you, well, I know life sucks, but you need to be happy because God. Choose joy also perpetuates the idea that negative emotions or allowing yourself to feel negative emotions is inherently bad. I've been in secular therapy for about two years now, and one thing I've spent a lot of time deconstructing is the belief that feeling negative emotions like sadness or anger is sinful. 
I've learned that is not wrong. It's not a sin to simply feel something. And in fact, giving yourself the space to sit with uncomfortable emotions is integral to processing traumatic experiences. It's not really possible to push aside negative emotions with unyielding optimism. It might work for a while, but odds are those suppressed feelings will eventually boil up to the surface. You can't demand that someone feel something they don't actually feel and expect that to improve their happiness long term. You might be able to get them to act like they feel different, but then who's really benefiting in that situation? It seems to me that the only ones who would benefit are those interested in preserving the narrative that belief in God is the only requirement for happiness. The purity of the gospel, why God sent Jesus, not to make us religious, that's a return to bondage, but instead to set us free. This one's been around for a while. The phrase, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, came about as a reaction to negative perceptions of not just Christianity, but religion in general. There are a lot of people who view religion as dogmatic and legalistic. They see religious practice as nothing more than following a strict set of rules and thus have no interest in participating. This causes a problem for evangelical Christians who are particularly interested in converting people to Christianity. So to continue recruiting people into the Christian faith, evangelicals started saying that Christianity isn't actually a religion, but is simply a relationship with Jesus. I don't have a problem with Christians who view their religious practice as a relationship with God. But to say that Christianity, with its rich history, various doctrines, and sacred texts, isn't a religion is kind of absurd. Religion is a social cultural system having to do with the divine or supernatural and is typically characterized by shared beliefs, ritual worship, and a system of morality. I'd say then that Christianity definitely fits this description. What's more is that, in my experience at least, this saying is most often used by fundamentalists, who are a subset of Christians who believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible and are viewed as very legalistic. Fundamentalists, while declaring that Christianity is just about having a personal relationship with God, will simultaneously disavow those who support gay marriage, believe in evolution, or, you know, vote for a Democrat, and say that they're not real Christians. If you vote Democrat, I don't even want you around this church. You can get out. You can get out, you demon. You shouldn't tell someone that your belief system is just a relationship, and then later hold them accountable to a complex set of dogmas, customs, and moral requirements. If you did, then what you're effectively doing is watering down Christianity to make it more palatable to those averse to organized religion. I think this saying can be harmful, especially to those who are being proselytized to, because it presents a distorted view of Christianity and prevents those who are considering becoming Christians from making an informed decision. Everyone deserves to know what they're getting into before getting into it. I mean, imagine converting because you're told that Christianity is just a relationship, only to later be ousted from your church because you don't think being gay is a sin. Our prayer for you and our prayer and hope in doing this video is just to encourage you as Christian girls to reject the lies of our culture, acknowledge that they're out there, choose to reject them, and instead base your life, your value, and your worth on what God says about you. This saying is a slight variation of the well-known Christianese phrase, be in the world, but not of the world. In the Bible, the word world is often synonymous with sin and the downfall of man. To be in the world, but not of it, means to be physically present in a world inhabited by sin, while not allowing yourself to be taken over by that sin. Christians should stand apart from the culture basically means the same thing. Christians should hold themselves to a moral standard that, in their view, the rest of the world doesn't. I am living for the Lord. I am living for the Lord. I am living for the Lord. While both of these sayings effectively communicate the same message, for this video, I decided to focus on Christians should stand apart from the culture because of its specific inclusion of the phrase, the culture. Growing up in evangelical churches, I've heard sermons on the dreaded culture more times than I can count. 
I was constantly told that our culture is morally bankrupt and that I should be wary of the culture lest I be dragged down by it. Culture today, the spirit of Babylon is still at work. I mean, there's sexual misconduct, drugs, alcohol, all kinds of, you know, pagan spirituality and religion. Believers are constantly tempted, harassed, opposed, threatened, uh, tempted to compromise. And how do you stay faithful to God in a world that's lost its mind? As a Christian, I didn't have to be told what the culture was. I knew the culture referred to anything that wasn't Christianity, and anything that wasn't Christianity was automatically sinful. However, now as someone who's not religious, I find it very confusing when some Christians talk about the culture. There are literally thousands of cultures across the world, from ethnic cultures to corporate work cultures to internet subcultures. So which culture is the culture that Christians are referring to? Well, the answer is all of them and none of them. Culture is just a Christian buzzword that's used to describe anything that isn't Christianity. It doesn't refer to any one culture, but is instead used to lump together millions of people belonging to thousands of cultures into one category, not Christian. This can be harmful because it furthers an us versus them narrative and ascribes malicious intent to an entire population of people that are otherwise very diverse. Non-Christians aren't these horribly immoral or maniacal people that have some big agenda to drag Christians down to hell with them. They're just normal people doing the best they can with the information they have, just like many Christians. So if the culture refers to anything that isn't Christianity, why don't they just say that? In my opinion, it's because telling people to stay away from anything that isn't Christianity sounds bad. It sounds controlling and dogmatic. I mean, if you think about it, organizing people into insider and outsider groups is also a manipulation technique used by cults. Vague references to the ill-defined culture allow them to get their message across without coming off like a nun with a wooden ruler. I wanna make it clear that I don't think all or even most Christians think that non-Christians are evil doers that shouldn't be associated with. But I've heard this saying repeated enough times by Christians that I think it's important that it's addressed. Now, I should address another harmful implication of this saying. It also perpetuates the idea that Christianity exists within a bubble, isolated from the influence of outside cultures. This simply isn't the case. For example, American evangelicalism upholds capitalism, the nuclear family, and individualism as so inherently virtuous that they're often considered Christian values themselves. In reality, those are pieces of American culture. It's astounding to hear someone say that Christians should stand apart from the culture and then loudly support politicians who oppose welfare programs for the poor because that's how Christians should vote. Jesus said don't give to the poor, right? Christians everywhere are a part of their surrounding culture, having values which come from both Christianity and other cultures. In order to make informed social and political decisions, they must be willing to acknowledge that. Otherwise, powerful people in the culture can take advantage of their religious sensibilities to create whatever social and political change they want, just by calling that change Christian. Now, if you're a Christian that uses these sayings, I don't think you're a bad person. Remember, I'm fluent in Christianese. I've used many of these sayings myself. It's often difficult to view these phrases objectively when our in-group uses them so regularly. All I'm asking is that we re-examine the purpose these cliches serve and whether or not we're inadvertently causing harm when we use them. I also acknowledge that these types of sayings aren't exclusive to Christianity. Every group is bound to develop a type of insider language. For example, I can't stand the saying, everyone is born an atheist until someone starts lying to them. Atheists routinely use this cliche, but I think it perpetuates harmful stereotypes about Christians and misunderstands the role human psychology plays in the development of religion. I was actually thinking of producing a companion piece to this video where I discuss harmful atheist sayings, but then I realized my husband Drew from Genetically Modified Skeptic kind of already has that covered. 
He has a great video on things atheists should stop saying that I'll pin down in the description. Finally, the handful of Christianese sayings I included in this video only scratch the surface. There are a lot more sayings we could dissect and discuss. So I'm curious, what are some Christianese sayings that come to your mind? Are there any that deserve criticism or are there any that serve a useful purpose? Let me know in the comments down below. Thanks so much for watching and a huge thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible. Please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. And if you'd like to follow me on social media, my Instagram is Taylor underscore the underscore antibot and my Twitter is the antibot. If you'd like to support this channel financially, my Patreon will be linked down in the description and I'll see you all in the next one. Say bye. <laughs>